Swayam Prabha. Digital India. Educated India. Welcome to this session. Um, in the previous session, uh, we have discussed that uh, how government safety net led to the aggravation of asymmetric information problem in the financial market and which aggravated, which created the problem of uh, adverse selection uh, and uh, moral hazard problem. Uh, and also we have seen that uh, it uh, created the problem of uh, too big to fail. And then we have seen that there was uh, several ba the fail bank failure became uh, more prevalent in the 1980s. Uh, one of the reason uh, uh, for the bank failure in the 1980s was uh, the existence of deposit insurance corporation. And the uh, further reason was because government is standing as the lender of the last resort, and also the problem of um, problem of too big to fail, uh, too big to fail and government standing as uh, lender of the last resort, all this aggravated the problems. So further, we can also see that in the 1980s, since the banking systems was uh, looking for uh, financial innovation to earn more and more profit, uh, because the traditional lines of business uh, is not, uh, they realize that uh, the traditional lines of business uh, is not going to uh, earn the more profit uh, because decreasing profitability of the traditional business and increased direct finance through commercial papers. Uh, commercial banks were forced to seek out new and potentially uh, risky business to keep their profits up by placing a greater percentage of their total loans in real estate and in credit extended to assist uh, corporate takeovers and leveraged uh, buyouts. So all this uh, led further all to adding fuel to the fire, uh, financial innovation produced a new financial instruments uh, that widened the score for uh, risk taking. So they also invested in junk bonds and they also insured uh, commercial mainly junk bonds as well. So all as a result what we can see that, uh, that there was a large bank failure in the 1980s. And for the reason we can also see that uh, larger that the financial consolidation uh, that also contributed to the uh, challenge. So larger and more complex uh, financial organization uh, challenge the regulation. One is that the increase uh, too big to fail problem became aggravated because uh, the financial consolidation, the merging of several financial institutions, financial and non-financial institutions, uh, their complex uh, relationship uh, increased the further aggravated the problem of too big to fail. The, the increased size of financial institution uh, resulting from financial consolidation uh, increases the too big to fail problem because there are now more large institutions whose failure would expose the financial system to systemic uh, risk. Thus, more financial institutions are likely to be treated uh, as too big to fail and the increased moral hazard incentives for these large institutions to take on greater risk. Uh, increases the fragility of the financial system. And second, the financial consolidation of banks with the other financial services firms means that government safety net uh, may be extended to new activities such as securities, uh, underwritings, insurance or real estate activities as occurred during the global financial crisis. So that means uh, this increase the incentive for risk taking in other areas as well, new activities that is uh, real estate, uh, insurance, etc. Because the people have witnessed that during the 2007-8 crisis, it was the banking sector which was the worst affected sector, financial sector and then they have been bailed out because government followed the that because of the too big to fail problem government bailed them out. So actually then this issue is spread to other sectors as well. So overall there is less incentive for large depositors, especially pension funds. 
uh, normally pension funds they will be monitoring uh, their investment whether the where, where wherever they invested for example they have invested in bond market they will be monitoring the bond issuers uh, financial activities project activities now they have less incentive uh, to do the monitoring so all these things further contributed uh, to the weakening health of the financial market so in this context uh, let us see how merger uh, normally we see that merger of the so bank merging of banks is going to increase the profitability i am just taking the screenshot of one of the newspaper clippings so we normally by reading this we can see that okay so because when merging of banks associate banks with the sbi so theoretically we expect that it is going to increase the efficiency because they will be having economies of scale and economies of scope so clearly we can see that is going to increase profitability but at the same time we can also see that the points that we have discussed uh, till now so far we know that is going to create uh, that means merging uh, then sbi is going to become too large right too big to fail so when it is becoming too big to fail it actually incentivizes this bank to make a risky investment uh, because anyway government is going to bail out if they fail and the investors the depositors with the sbi the deposit even with the individual depositors and the institutional investors depositors like um, pension funds and all they have less incentive to monitor them so what we have to see that on the one way fine theoretically is going to maybe it is the profitability is going to enhance obviously there are several things we need to see not not necessary that profitability will be uh, enhancing uh, increasing because uh, some banks balance sheet maybe the net worth they may be having lots of non performing asset however overall we can see that maybe because of economic scale their profitability is increasing but at the same time we also need to think that this merging or becoming too big to too big too large uh, big financial institution is also going to uh, aggravate the asymmetric information problem and finally the long term it may adversely affect the working the smooth working of the financial system similarly here again you can see that many banks are getting merged and the takeaway message for, for us here is that uh, based on the analysis that we had we can see that all these going to aggravate the uh, asymmetric information problem moral hazard uh, here and it may uh, in the long term the financial system may collapse because of uh, this bank merging and we can see that there are now the competition is uh, declining already we know that now we have only 40 12 commercial scheduled commercial banks uh, in india so that means the number of competitive bank the competition the number of banks uh, in the country is uh, declining as compared to us for example they have more than 5000 banks so that means the each and every banks in india is going to occupy its own stand that means it's becoming a oligopoly market and that means uh, government won't allow we cannot you not only government the general public or looking at the overall welfare of the economy we cannot allow uh, or any of these bank to fail so obviously we know that it is aggravating the adverse selection problem so let us now see the let us have a quick overview uh, of the banking crisis uh, throughout the world we can see that one deposit insurance corporation it was uh, implemented uh, in several countries however deposit insurance is not to blame for some of these banking crises we know that uh, we already saw that the government safety net that also where the government stands ready to bail out troubled financial institution that also uh, contributed to the banking crisis and we can see from this figure we can see that the banking crisis throughout the world uh, since 1970s so the red colored you can see that this is a systemic banking crisis is uh, is mostly in the us uh, north america and also you can see here in the russia china uh, these countries uh, and also in europe uh, you can see that so you can see mostly uh, there was systemic banking crisis and systemic banking crisis occurs when many banks in a country are in a serious solvency or liquidity problems at the same time either because there are all hit by the same outside shock or because failure of in one bank or a bank of 
uh, group of banks spread to other banks in the system. So, more specifically, a systemic banking crisis is a situation when a country's corporate and financial sectors experience uh, many defaults and financial institutions and corporations face great difficulties paying contracts on time. Then the episodes of non-systemic uh, crisis you can see in these areas uh, in India as well, uh, in Australia. Uh, so non-crisis only few places um, and there are insufficient information in some countries. This actually the bank failure which, which we have seen that government is willing to bail out banks because bank failure that we have already discussed many times that means uh, we cannot allow banks to fail too big to fail problem. So actually it actually the bailout package it cost a huge amount uh, lots of uh, cost on the society. Uh, so I am showing you the table that means uh, the how the how much cost the bank failure the cost of rescuing banks uh, how much it cost. For example, in Indonesia in during 1997 to 2001 as per the estimate uh, it, uh, the cost was 57 percentage of the GDP. So from this itself we can see that how important this bailout package, how, how the government is according uh, priorities or that means according importance to this bailout program because you know that actually this much money uh, they spend uh, in the rescuing of banks. So we can see these are the all the other countries, Argentina, Thailand and all you can see the uh, cost, cost as a percentage of GDP uh, in the bailout program. So you can see China they spend 18 percent of the GDP in uh, 1998 and Norway they spend 3 percent of the GDP in 1991-93 period. Then during the, during the global crisis of 2007-2009 period. Uh, Iceland they spend 13 percent of the GDP and you can see for example uh, US 4 percent of the GDP was uh, spent for the uh, as a response to uh, it took is to rescue the banks. So what we have covered so far uh, is mainly the social safety nets and how it contributed to the bank failure I would say social safety net and deposit insurance corporations and government standing as a lender of the last resort we can see we saw that it actually aggravated uh, it also aggravated the problem of asymmetric information and many banks failed uh, even bank fail even uh, again government is further ready to stand out to the bail uh, to bail them out. Uh, now we also saw here actually many governments uh, many countries they spend uh, a lot of public money uh, in order to save the in order to rescue the banks from uh, collapse in order to the ultimate objective was to prevent the collapse of the uh, financial system or uh, to prevent uh, the financial crisis. Now let us continue this discussion by seeing what are the different types of financial regulation uh, that can be further uh, aimed at lessening this asymmetric information problem and excessive risk taking in the financial system. Because what we can see that uh, because government cannot uh, give away, give up the banking system and the financial system if there is a serious financial crisis uh, is popping up then it is the duty of the is the responsibility of the uh, government to prevent them. So anyway they will be bailing it out however uh, government uh, across the globe uh, countries across the globe started further regulating uh, the financial market because the thing is that then they understood that uh, they have to further uh, minimize lessen the asymmetric information problem and excessive risk taking in the financial system. So as a result the regulatory bodies put up several types of diff different types of financial regulation and overall we can summarize put everything into eight types of uh, financial regulations. So number wise you can see capital requirements and second one is prompt corrective actions, restrictions on asset holdings and chartering and examinations and assessment of risk management, disclosure requirement, consumer protection and uh, restrictions on competition. So these are the broad types, eight types of financial regulations and across the globe by country wise country we can see that some countries will be putting uh, depending some of this regulation more heavily 
uh, not that all the eight uh, types of financial regulation is uh, universally prevalent. Most, however, most of the countries uh, will be following uh, most of these. And we, have, uh, for example, starting with the first one, capital requirement, there is universally that globally there is some agreement that uh, what should be the capital requirements of the banks. What are the required requirements that each bank, uh, the banks. Uh, across the uh, globe, uh, it means each country should be following. There is a uh, globally required standard. So, let us discuss this one by one, uh, first starting with the uh, capital requirements. Coming to this one, capital requirements, this is the government imposed capital requirements are one way of minimizing moral hazard at financial institutions. So, when financial institution is forced to hold a large amount of equity capital, uh, the institution has more to institutions has more to lose if it fails and is thus more likely to pursue less risky activities. This point we have seen in one of the previous session because as where we discussed that capital functions as a cushion when bad shock shocks occur. That means making it less likely that a financial institutions will fail and thereby directly adding to the safety and soundness of financial institutions. Here uh, the capital requirements for banks uh, take two forms. The first type is based on the leverage ratio that means the amount of capital uh, divided by the bank's total assets. So, that is the leverage ratio that is 1. So, the leverage ratio that means a well capitalized bank. So, accordingly based on the leverage ca ratio we can categorize broadly we can uh, categorize bank into three category. Uh, one is uh, well capitalized banks that means a bank's leverage ratio of 5 percentage or greater is called as the bank with the bank is a, is a well capitalized bank. And another is adequately capitalized bank that means a bank's leverage ratio of 4 percentage that is uh, amount of capital divided by the bank's total assets if it is 4 percentage it has been termed as classified as adequately capitalized bank and then called under capitalized bank means a bank leverage ratio less than 4 percentage. These banks a lower leverage ratio banks with a lower lower uh, leverage ratio that means under capitalized bank especially one below 3 percentage triggers increased regulatory restrictions uh, on the banks that means restrictions on asset growth, uh, restrictions on new branches and, uh, and on new lines of business. So, there is another concept called that the, the framework that is the capital adequacy uh, is from the Basel framework. Uh, Basel framework means the Basel committee uh, initially named as the committee on banking regulations and supervisory practices was established by the central bank governors of the group of 10 countries at the end of 1974. So, this is uh, the committee's first meeting took place in February 1975 and the meetings have been held regularly three, three or four times a year since. It was actually now several countries are members of this Basel framework where the heads of the appointed uh, authority of central banks of each country they meet together uh, at Basel is a city near to Germany. So, it is in Switzerland and border to Germany. So, the committee uh, headquartered at the Bank for International Settlements in Basel uh, was established to enhance uh, financial stability by improving the quality of banking supervision worldwide uh, and to serve as a forum for regular cooperation between its member countries uh, on banking supervisory matters. So, the representative of central banks across the, across the globe they meet uh, to Basel and then they, uh, for they uh, develop the framework or regulatory framework and one of them uh, is the capital adequacy part. So, here the committee has established a series of international standards for bank regulation, uh, most notably is landmark publication of the accords on capital adequacy which are commonly known as Basel 1, Basel 3 and most recently especially after 19 
sorry 2007-8 crisis uh, as a response to 2007-8 crisis uh, there is basel 3 accord was also uh, published so you can get more information of basel regulation by visiting rbi website so coming to especially basel 3 it clearly uh, laid out the requirement of tier 1 capital ratio it is a key measure of a bank's financial strength that has been adopted as part of the Basel 3 Accord on Bank Regulation. So Basel 3, uh, it has laid mostly laid on the tier 1 capital ratio and tier 1 capital ratio of a bank is the ratio of bank's core tier 1 capital to its total risk weighted assets. This is the a uh, new measure that is uh, used to regulate uh, ensure the bank's uh, capital uh, requirements that the bank capital uh, requirements so coming to that the bank's core tier 1 capital and uh, let us see what is bank's core tier 1 capital so the core tier 1 capital is bank's equity capital and disclosed reserve this constitute the tier 1 capital and coming to the assets, assets especially loans and uh, other re related assets, uh, borrowings, etc., by the bank. So, these also need to be risk weighted assets. So, risk weighted assets are the assets that the bank holds and that are evaluated for credit risk. That means assets are assigned a weight according to their level of credit risk. For example, you can see that the wall cash with the bank and the reserve with the uh, reserve, uh, required reserve and excess reserve with the central bank, it will be weighted uh, zero. They are asset but it will be weighted zero because there is a zero risk. While mortgage loan, you know that there is a high default risk, it can be uh, based on the uh, exact uh, debt instrument, uh, the loan, uh, it may be for example, it may carry a weight of 30 percentage or 35 or 50 percentage etc based on their uh, default risk right so this is uh, so let us see based on this how to calculate the tier 1 capital ratio uh, assume that a bank holds 5 million in core capital uh, that is the core capital means uh, equity capital uh, and disclosed reserves and it has a total of two loans for the sake of simplicity let us say that they have only two loans that is assets one worth uh, 10 million with a risk of 50 percentage default risk and another uh, worth uh, 20 million with a risk of uh, 70 percentage uh, default risk so in this way let us see uh, the calculate the tier 1 capital ratio so you can see that this is the uh, core capital and we need to take the weighted risk weighted assets that is actually the one with the 50 percentage uh, default risk the second one 20 million with a 70 uh, percentage default risk then multiplied by 100 then you can see uh, the tier 1 capital ratio from this estimate it is 26.3 percentage then what basel 3 capital adequacy ratio uh, requirement say so here uh, most be during be before prior to the financial crisis most banks held too much debt too much debt and uh, low levels of equity and they lacked adequate capital to absorb losses resulting from financial crisis the tier 1 capital ratio was introduced in 2010 after the financial crisis as a measure of a bank's ability to withstand uh, financial distress so basel 3 requests that equity com component of tier 1 capital should be at least 4.5 percentage of risk weighted asset this is the requirement requirement given by basel 3 and central banks across the globe uh, they will be following who is the member of this basel 3 india is a member india follow uh, basel 3 framework then the indian central bank rbi asks its member bank to follow this criteria it tightened the capital adequacy requirement that banks are required to observe. So the accord uh, categorizes uh, regulatory capital into tier 1 and tier 2. Uh, under Basel 3, the minimum common equity tier 1 increased to 4.5 percentage. It also increased the minimum tier 1 capital to 6 percentage from 4 percentage uh, in Basel 2. So the overall minimum regulatory capital ratio was left 
unchanged uh, at uh, 8 percentage uh, out of which 6 percentage is tier 1 uh, capital. These are the definitions of the tier 1 and tier 2 capital. Tier 1 uh, you can see equity tier 1 uh, these are all the components and the requirement is um, it should be greater than or equal to 4.5 percentage but it should be greater than 4.5 percentage. The second one is additional tier 1 capital this also uh, introduced by Basel 3 these are all the components included in that that is a related surplus additional qualifying minority interest and regulatory adjustment. So, this should be uh, greater than 6 percentage and then tier 2 capital that means some of capital instruments meeting the criteria for tier 2 and related surplus additional qualifying minority interest, uh, qualifying uh, loan loss provision all together it should be uh, greater than 8 percentage that is according to Basel 3. So, the common equity tier 1 capital is going also called as going concern basis because this is the highest quality uh, of regulatory capital as it absorbs losses immediately when they occur. So, uh, tier 1 capital provides loss absor absorption uh, on a going concern basis. At the same time, this tier 2 it is considered as a gone concern because tier 2 capital is gone concern capital that is when a bank fails tier 2 instruments must absorb losses before uh, deposit is uh, and general credit is due. Before we summarize, let us also have a quick overview of Basel 1 at least uh, what, what is the uh, Basel capital uh, 1 capital accord. So, at that time the 90-90-88 uh, accord called the minimum ratio of capital to risk weighted asset 8 percent to be implemented by the 1992. Uh, so, I am keeping some text here uh, the major principle that they followed in uh, uh, Basel 1 accord that means um, bank must hold equity capital to at least uh, 6 at least a fixed percent and these are all the further provisions. This is only for your review and the reason one obviously you know that uh, not base Basel 3 that is the uh, the one which we discussed a couple of minutes before that is the uh, current requirement uh, that the, the current capital requirements in India as well uh, across many other countries other uh, banks in other countries who are is following Basel framework. Uh, let us conclude now uh, stop here and uh, meet in the next session. Thank you.